<laughs> not too long ago that I was in New Orleans, you know, and I meet a good buddy of mine over there, it's Cormier. And Cormier, he's born and raised way back in the country. For how come he didn't stay there, I don't know, me. Anyhow, he come in New Orleans, never did been there before. The first thing, Don lost his place, you know. So Cormier decided to take a haircut. Well, he passed to that one of them biggest barber shop what they got in New Orleans there. And Cormier sitting in that chair board just like a king, taking that haircut, you know, and got a pretty little manicure as she's walking around there. And Cormier just keeps stare at that girl, just keep eyeball that girl, don't ever move his head, you know. <laughs> so when that girl noticed that, how Cormier keeps stare at her, she think, well, he must have want some kind of service. So she come over there and she catch him by the hand like that man, start rub on his fingernail, you know. <laughs> She said, my friend, might you like to have your cuticle pushed back? <laughs> Come here, say, well, no, thank you. He said, I believe when I stand up and walk around a little while, he's gonna go back like that. <laughs> but this old boy, Alex on, man, let me tell you one thing. Alex on, he was telling me, says, last year, day in August, hot like everything, you know. And he's working with one of them great big seismograph crew. So he said they was over there in Africa. And he said, one day the boss man come there, he said, Alex on, he said, look, he said, I want you to make 10 mile across the desert like that, man, cut to your left, go 10 mile and then back. And he said, put some of them little explosion shot there, about every half mile, you know, so we can get cross-action picture that for them all map. He said, boss, he said, how am I supposed to pass on that desert, huh? Well, he said, got a fella down the road going to rent you a camel to pass that. <laughs> so he go back down there and Alex on tell that fella he got to have a camel to go on the desert there, you know. So that fella asked Alex on, he said, how long you going to use that camel? <coughs> well, he said, that's going to be for 10 days there. Well, my friend, he said, 10 days. He said, them camel can hold out for 10 days. He said, seven days, that's the most what it can go, you know. But my friend, he said, that ain't gonna help me too much because I'm gonna be gone at least 10 days. He said, man, I got to have that for 10 days. Well, my friend, he said, just couldn't hold out that long with seven day water supply. But I told you what, now, if you want, he said, we can supercharge one of them camel down here. <laughs> but he said, that's 25% extra, you know. He said, what the devil, what you talk about? Supercharge them camel. Well, he said, we put that camel to the water trough that to start let him drink his, his seven day supply, you know. Of course, we got the mark on the trough there. He gonna stand there and drank and drank and drank, you know. But just about the time he get to that mark, what we got, he gonna start roll his eyes around, man gonna start lap on that water like that, you know. But he said that camel's getting ready to quit right there. So he said, you standing behind him with a brick in each hand like that. You know? And he said, just when that camel start to quit, man, pachong, you slap his balls between them. <laughs> He said, that give him that extra three-day supply. You know? <laughs> he said, yeah, but jeez, man, he said, that don't hurt. He said, no, not unless you get your fingers caught between the bricks. <laughs> Tell you, this old bartender was telling me here the other day. He said, God bless. He said, God, a funny thing happened the other day. He said, God, this fella come in there. Man, he's shaking all over, nervous as he can be, you know. He come up there. He said, bartender, he said, please. He said, how about just give me one drink that to kind of pacify my nerve, huh? He said, look, buddy, he said, we can't give our drink like that. He said, get on out the way. He said, no, buddy, look, he said, man, I come from Port Arthur, me. He said, I come over that to hunt some job. I don't got a penny, don't got a nickel, man, get in the automobile wreck there. He said, I'm so shook up and nervous. He said, I don't know what to do. Please, one drink to kind of settle my nerve there. He said, look, fella, I tell you, man, we can't give our drink like that, no. He said, buddy, he said, tell you what, he said, you gonna give me just one drink there? He said, I'm gonna show you the neatest trick what you ever see there. He said, what the devil, I hear that dad gum trick stuff all the time. He said, what kind of trick you talk about? 
But then, look, he said, I'm going to show you. He said, man, if you're going to give me just one drink, I'm going to show you I can fart the eyes of that. <laughs> Say, my friend, you done lost your mind. Huh? Man, just give me one drink, man. I'm going to show you I can do that. You know? But he said, I don't got nothing to lose. So he gave him that drink, you know. He said, God, bless what thing that show was, little bit of drink there. He said, how about just one more there? He said, look, fella, we don't make a bargain yet. You tell me one drink, you going to fart the eyes of that. <laughs> After you do that, then I'm going to give you a big drink. Well, he said, OK. So he jumped up on the bar there, you know, and he pulled his pants down and he stooped down. He starts grunt and strain and person. <laughs> man, he just crap all over the car. You know? Man, the bar team start race and jeez, my friend, he said, what the devil, man, look at the mess, what you make there? Man, I'm gonna have to close the place and get that clean off. He said, how come you start like that, eh? He said, bar team, look, he said, even Frank Sinatra, before he start to sing, he got to clear his throat, eh? Yeah, they were so standing plus seed, you know, they was real good friends. And they was married, both married, you know, and they associate with one another all the time, you know, drank beer with one another. So one day, plus seed's old lady, she run off with so stan. And man, plus he'd feel bad about that. He got to a beer joint one night there, and he was sitting there drinking some beer, and poor soon man, so stan's wife come in there, you know. So she get to visit with Placid and she say, Placid, she say, I never did thought something like that gonna happen there. She say, I, I, I didn't never thought my husband gonna run off with your wife. And Placid say, well, man, I never have something affect me like that. So so stands why she say, Placid, she say, how come me and you don't go someplace, man, get some revenge, huh? So he say, well, I got a room upstairs there. So they get upstairs, man, and they get some revenge, you know. So after a while, they come out there. <laughs> and they start drinking some jacks, and they keep on drinking that beer, you know, and pretty soon, so stands why I say, God bless Placid. She said, the more I thought about that, the more burn up I am, man. She said, I told you, she said, Placid, she said, how come we don't get some more revenge? <laughs> so man, he said, back upstairs they go, you know. After a while, come back down there, and they start drinking that beer, man, drink some more beer, they cry on each other's shoulder there. And for a son, so stands why I say, plus it, she say, you know something, I never have something hit me solid like that. That affect me so much, man, I've told you one thing, I don't know what to do. She say, how come we don't get some more revenge? <laughs> So Placid say, look, honey, he said, God, dog, no. He said, you don't believe you carry a grudge too long? <laughs> he said, but beside that, man, I don't have no more hard feeling, man. You know, several years ago, they got these two fellas was working in that carbon black plant way over there behind Weeks Island. And it was during the winter time there. And boy, I tell you one thing, old Zephran come in one night and he tell his wife, he said, honey, he said, don't believe I'm going to work tomorrow. So I got some cramp on my stomach and cold like it is there. So I don't believe I can work with that. She says, Zephran, she said, how come you don't take you some ex lag going to clean you out good there? <laughs> I say, if I go and took that axe, like I'm going to done my job. Well, she said, how you going to done your job if you come and go and keep on crap like that? Well, he said, I guess that's about right. So, man, he take him a bunch of that axe, like, you know. <laughs> God bless not. The next morning is cool like everything. He got to got up well before day broke, you know. Because <laughs> he's waiting for his ride there. So, man, he got on his overcoat, got his lunch and everything, you know. And, for a soon man, them cramps take his stomach real bad there. Hon, honey, he said, I got to go. He said, if Duplish ain't gonna show up, tell him don't go away. He take a streak out the backyard, you know, to that outhouse back there, to that two-hole job. 
<laughs> man, he take his overcoat off right quick, man, sat down on the side there, and he jerk his pants down, he sit down there, and he was start grunt and strand, you know, got his elbow on each knee, rest his self there. <laughs> For a son, man, his left elbow sleep off there, and knock his overcoat down and hit the hole there. God, dog, he says, so I say, hell come on, boy. <laughs> So he far, hurry up, that man finished the job, and then he run out there, and he look around, he find the clothesline pole. So he come back in there, and he's fishing around in the hole with that pole, you know, and about that time, the horn start blowing. He said, honey, he said, told Duplichin to come see that. So Duplichin come back down, he said, Zephyrin, what the hell you done? <laughs> he said, Duplichin, he said, run, got your spotlight. He said, drop my overcoat down in this hole here. <laughs> he said, to hell with your overcoat, Zephyrin. He said, leave that be. He said, we're going to be late for work. He said, come on, let's go. No, no, Duplichin, he said, run, got your spotlight. He said, I got to get my overcoat out that hole there. He said, to hell with that, Zephran. He said, even if you got that overcoat out that hole, that might, you know you can't wear that. <laughs> yeah, but Duplichet, he said, I got my lunch in the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> this old boy was in this service, you know. God bless old Henri. <coughs> he was gone for a little better than two years, and finally when he come home, he found he got a little baby boy that's to about almost six months old. God bless, he start wrecked all laid over the cold, you know. <laughs> he said, look, he said, I'm gone for better than two years, and he said, I got that little boy up for six months old. He said, who in the hell done that? I bet that's my good friend Fontenot responsible for that. <laughs> no, she said, that's not your friend Fontenot. God, dog, he said, that must be my, my real close friend there, uh, Belizeur. No, it's not you, close friend, Belizeur. Well, it's got to be one of my good friends. I bet that was my good friend, Melanson, huh? <laughs> she said, why you get that crap about you, friends? You don't think I got some friends? <laughs> you know, back then, World War II, they got this old boy was going around selling them war bombs. And he get way back up there in the country at the end of the road. And he come up to this old boy, Trahon. He was plowing in his field there. And he said, my friend, he said, you like to buy some war bonds? Trahon said, war bonds? said, what that's for? Well, he said, that's to help win the war. What's going on, this big fight, you know? God bless, he said, I didn't know it's got somebody fighting there. Man, he said, we're right in the big middle of World War II there. He said, you don't ever listen to your radio there? No, he said, I don't got no radio there. And he said, of course, just me and the old lady, we can't read it all us. <laughs> God bless what he said, you know who is Roosevelt, huh? <coughs> Roosevelt, man, he said, look to me like that fella got something to done with the government. <laughs> God bless my friend. He said, you didn't heard about, about Pearl Harbor that? Oh, Pearl Harbor, he said, no, don't believe. He said, I can run ask the old lady. She know all them women all around. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, he said, you still don't understand. He said, how about Winston Churchill? You didn't heard nothing about Winston Churchill? And just about that time, his wife stepped out on the co on the porch there. We got one of them little cup of coffee. You know, he said, Trahan, better come take your coffee before that got cold. So Trahan get over there, and his wife said, Trahan, she said, who that man you talking with out there? Oh, honey, he said, the best I can understand, that man tell me his name's Schmidt, and... He told me he got a good friend by the name of Roosevelt, and that fella take a woman by the name of Pearl Harbor and him here behind the church and get him in trouble, and now he want me to go his barn. <laughs> Like this, these people living way out in one, one of them houseboats, way behind Morgan City back then, the swamp, you know, man, and let me tell you one thing. They got the bayous and the lake and the swamp back there. Well, there was hot fish, stuff like that, you know. So every once in a while, this, this got, fella got Nunez, got this little grocery store man on his barge, and he passed around through that and sold them people grocery, you know, and then the doctor, he come in his little outboard, you know, to check once in a while, and... 
So one day the doctor's coming down them by you and he's hear somebody hollering, Yeah, hey, doc, yeah, hey, doc. So when he see that lady die, you know, he stop up then. He said, Miss Melanson, he said, how you doing? Oh, doc, she says, poor good, but she said, God bless doc. She said, I don't know what to do. She said, I got some bug in the bush. He said, bug in the bush? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my way, doc, she said, them bug in the bush are about to drive me crazy. They crawl all over me and all the time. Oh, man, he said, I understand what you're talking about now, bog in the bush. <laughs> he said, you got to go into town, go to the drugstore. I told the druggist you want some blue ointment. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget that name, blue ointment. Spread that stuff on your staff, good and thick, and can kill all the bog in the bush. <laughs> So sure enough, man, the next day she get in her little boat and she's going to town and she go to the drugstore and she said, my friend, she said, I got to have something that the doctor passed yesterday tell me what you got, but I don't forget the name of that stuff what he tell me. <clears throat> How he called that now? God bless, no. They got a color to that name what he tell me to God there. Let's see how he called that now. <laughs> the drugger said, well, lady, for what you gonna use that stuff? <laughs> she said, oh, that's, well, that stuff, man, that's to kill some bug in the bush, you know. <laughs> oh, man, he said, something to kill bug in the bush and got a color to that. Oh, man, hold on, he said, that must be Paris green, huh? <laughs> Oh, man, she said, that's bound to be what he talk about. She said, well, I want plenty of meat. <laughs> so she did that, she go back to her house, you know. So about a week after that, man, the doctor's coming in by there again, and he see Madame Melanson, she's sitting on her little houseboat, rock to beat the band, you know. <laughs> Madame Melanson, I said, comment ça va? Oh, doc, she said, bon, man, fake. He said, you pass the town and get that stuff what I tell you about that? Oh, man, for sure, doc. She said, I passed that, get plenty of that stuff, me. <laughs> he said, well, told me, he said, that stuff done it for a good job, eh? <laughs> God bless, no, doc. She said, you talk about something done a good job. <laughs> <laughs> doc, she said, let me tell you. She said, that stuff kill all the bug in the bush. <laughs> kill the bush. <laughs> and two fishermen down the bayou. I want to tell you something what happened with me the other day. Oh, I'm way back there along the bayou. And I run into Father Celestine over there. And he come to me, he say, Cyprian, he say, look, I want to ask you something there. He say, you travel around a whole lot and you know plenty of people. And he say, you seem to got along pretty good. Well, you know, Father Celestine in his parish down his church, they don't got too much money. And he tell me that he want to raise some money if he can done that for his church there. <coughs> and he asked me, he said, Cyprian, he said, how I'm going about that? He said, what I'm going to do? So I thought, I said, well, Father Celestine, let me tell you. You know them horse people, they always seem to get plenty of money. How come you don't go to one of them horse auction and look around a little bit? You might come up with something pretty good. So Father Celestine, he gone to one of them horse auction. So he go, he buy one of them animal there. But the horse, what he bought, was turned out to be a donkey. <laughs> Anyhow, Father Celestine thought, well, he just as well entered the donkey in a race. Well, his donkey come in third. And the next morning, the paper read on top the headline there, Say, Father Celestine's ass shows. <laughs> oh, man, the bishop, he see that. And let me tell you one thing, he get his matter, boy, start raising some hell, you know. Anyhow, the next day, the donkey, he come in first that time. Well, then they put new headline in the paper there, and it read like this. Father Celestine's ass out front. <laughs> God bless, let me tell you one thing, that bishop, boy, he don't know what to do. Then he wring his hands, pull his hair, and he's really up in arm, you know. He got to thinking about that. He said, something got to be done. 
Because there, Father Celestine, he done added the donkey again. And this time, he come in second. So they put big headline on the paper the next, the next morning there, which go like this, say, Father Sally stands ass back in place. <laughs> oh, man, let me tell you one thing. The Archbishop said, well, he gone got rid of that. So he called the, the priest and he tell him, God bless, look, he said, you can't enter that donkey in that ass in no more races like that. <laughs> so the next day, the man, let me tell you, when the paper come out, he come on the headline like this. The bishop scratches Father Sally Stein's ass. <laughs> well, finally the bishop, he said, God, dog, Father Sally Stein, he said, you got to get rid of that donkey. Well, Father Sally Stein, he got to looking around and talking to people. Well, he can't do nothing with, me, with that, you know, and he asked me, uh, sit around, he said, look, he said, what am I going to with that? Well, I said, give it away, got rid of it somehow. So Father Sally Stein said, God bless, that's a pretty good idea. So. He just take that, that ass, that donkey there, and he makes Sister Clotilde a present of that donkey for a pet, you know? Man, let me tell you, my friend, when the bishop hear about this, he called right quick. He said, Sister Clotilde, look, he said, you got to got rid of that animal at once. So it done anything. Well, she finally managed to sell that donkey for $10. Then the big surprise come the next morning when the headline come out, and it read like this. Sister Clotilde paddled her ass for 10 bucks. <laughs> you know, two days later, they buried that bishop. <laughs> That's last summer there on the Bayou Vermilion. And man, I'm sitting there on the Bayou Bank, man, fishing, you know. It's kind of hot that day, but God, dog, I'm under them great big oak trees, what they got there. And man, there was nice little breeze was coming under there. Well, I see that for about two hours, you know. And God bless, after a while, I'm just about going to sleep. And I, I hear that <laughs> God bless, I raise myself up and I look. Man, I see Felix coming in his odd board, you know. <laughs> And God, the dog, no boy, he got Agnes riding with him in that. <laughs> well, just when I wake up, man, patron, man, I see Agnes hit the water, you know. She, God dang, they ain't got no fish can swim, swim fast like Agnes, that. She come to that bank quick, that man, she take off like a rabbit. In fact, hell, a rabbit don't stood a good chance running with Agnes, that, you know. So when Felix getting that odd board started, I say, Felix, how I see it? So he come to the bank there, you know, and he said, God bless, Cipran. He said, how long you was sitting there? Oh, Felix, I said, that's for about two hours I'm sitting there. But when I wake up, I hear that outboard, you know, and I look out there and I see Agnes just jump in the water there. And God, dog, I didn't thought he's got a girl can swim fast like that. Man, she come to the bank and she take off like lightning there. In fact, she passed me so fast, she didn't even saw I was sitting there. What I like to know, Felix, what the hell's going on in that odd board there? <laughs> See, Pran, he said, let me tell you about that now. He said, you know, that's a long time me and Agnes gone together. In fact, we planned to get married. But we was just, uh, how you call, cruise along in that odd board, you know. We was love and sweet talk. So after a while, I get to kissing Agnes and loving her, and man, she begin to get hot, you know. So, man, I keep my arm around her and kiss her and bite her ear, and pretty soon I get my hand down in the front of her dress, man, I start play with them boobies. <laughs> well, man, you talk about something. Man, Agnes like that, you know. So he said, I take my hand out there, boy, and he said, I raise her dress up and put it down in her pants there. Oh, super, huh? He said, I'm get to playing around with that monkey. Dog. <laughs> Jeez, man, you talk about so Oh, man, Agnes like to go on all to pieces. And she start to get right on top of me, you know. We sit around, I see right there, man, I got Agnes right where I wanted, you know. <laughs> so he said, with my right hand, I keep playing around with that monkey. Dog. My left hand, he said, I reach back to shut off that outboard. God damn, man, I hit that spark plug. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, this little boy, I was sitting in this real estate man's office the other day when this fella come walking there, you know, and when he walk in, you know, the real estate man look at him. 
He said, let me show you something there, Luke. He said, you know, he said, I got that beautiful farm right there. He said, got 800 acres there. Luke, he said, I'm going to sell you that for $800. 800 acres for $800? He said, yeah, that's right. He said, look, them big, beautiful trees, what they got. Got a nice stream go through there. Got a little lake over there in the corner. Luke said, God bless, man. He said, that's a bargain, yeah. He said, where in the hell that farm's located? Oh, he said, that's up this, across the border up there in Arkansas someplace, there. Huh? <laughs> Luke said, God bless. No, he said, I believe I'm going to that. So he said, he finally get over that to check that, that farm where he buy, you know. God, dog, he said, they ain't got nothing but just a few scrub oak pine trees there. Got no lake and no stream at all. In fact, he said, all what they got is rock and sand, and just hard land. But he gonna make the best of it anyhow, cause still got 800 acres, you know, for $800 there. So he managed to dig up whole four to three pound of that hard soil there and send that to the state conversation department. <laughs> He said, I want you fellas to analyze that soil and told me what is the best kind of crop what I can produce there. So he finally get the letter back from the conversation department. <laughs> <laughs> they said, we thorough analyze your soil and we believe that pumpkin going to be your best crop. <laughs> so man, he said, he plant the hell out of them pumpkin seeds, boy. <laughs> And in time, he said, man, the pumpkin vine just about take the whole place, you know. Man, he got lots of big leaf and planted beautiful bloom, but no pumpkin. <laughs> so he write back, he said, what the devil's going on there? He said, you fellas goof up someplace. He said, I got vines all over the place there, got big leaf and planted bloom, but no pumpkin. He said, what the hell happened? <laughs> so by and by, take another letter there and say, well, we overlook one little thing. In the particular area where your farm located, <laughs> they don't got no bees to pollinate them bloom. <laughs> so what you're gonna have to do, you're gonna have to got you one of them eyedropper. You go to the male bloom and got a little of that pollen and you transfer that to the female bloom so they're gonna reproduce, you know. He right back, he said, that gum, I want to tell you fellas one thing. He said, I've done a lot of things in my life, yeah. <laughs> he said, I was around big bookie joint there. He said, I was got some gambling then. And at one time I was paddled dope and I was bootleg. But he said, I'll be damned if I'm going to be a pimp and a pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs>